here with you. Glad we could step in for your pastor um, this Sunday. Now, we've had opportunity to be at, at Capital City Church in the past, uh, minister on different occasions. In fact, I remember a time we came and did a Christmas banquet. I think it was a dinner. And, and uh, I, uh, I came out in costume. I do these little Bible characters where I get dressed up in in a costume, and uh, I came out at Christmas. I was Joseph. That's not the Joseph of Egypt. That's the Joseph of Mary and Joseph. And uh, did a did a monologue or about a twenty minute presentation. And uh, so I, I've been in your pastor and Tina have been friends of ours from the time they first arrived in the in this state. Came here to to uh, Madison. We attended some seminars together. That's where I got to know him. Yeah, we have been friends since. We've been in their home, and they've been in our home. In fact, I've invited them to come on up during this time away and spend a little time, if you'd like to, at our home. We live in Wapaka, Wisconsin. Wapaka happens to be the uh, state headquarters for the Assemblies of God for Wisconsin and Northern Michigan. And uh, we have a home there. And this is our second time to have lived in, in Wapaka. Back in the 60s, before I got this bad case of gray hair, I was a youth director. And uh, then when I turned gray, they, they turned me out. No, that's not really how it happened. But uh, so we, uh, I've served, we served as youth pastors in the past, the youth director for the state and for the district. Spent a little time in our national headquarters, which is in Springfield, Missouri, and then came back to Wisconsin, pastored for 21 years in Racine, Wisconsin. And uh, from that office, Racine came back to Wapaka and uh, was elected to a state office for the assemblies as district secretary, executive secretary for the district. And then for the past four and a half years, four years, a little few months now, we've been retired from full-time ministry, still very active, up speaking on weekends. The Don and I direct a program for older adults called 50 Plus Ministries. So we do some retreats and rallies, and uh, only see one of you that even looks like you qualify here today. The uh, rest of you are going to have to grow up first. Uh, see a little poster on the bulletin board back there that says 50 plus retreat. That's, that's one of the ministries that we're responsible for. So just a little, little bit of a history and background. Do I have any more quarter? Am I, I'm on a short leash here. Okay, I just want to know how far I can go before I get jerked up. Uh, I want, to, I want to talk to you about the subject that is uh, up on the screen, living like a king's kid. But before I do, I, I want to see if I can collect a little more evidence to support a, a, a hypothesis that I have about how we feel about our relationship with the Lord extended over a period of time. So I have to do a little informal survey. How many of you have been a Christian for five years or less and have attended church? Five years or less. Uh, five years or less have been a Christian and began attending church. How many ten years uh, or less? You, you would add your, your hand. Uh, ten years or less? Okay, uh, how about twenty years or less? Anybody been a Christian longer than twenty years? Okay, still, still, still in the game here. Uh, Thirty years? Still in the game. Forty years? Still in the game back? No. Thirty years and out. Uh, okay. <laughs> Forty years here? Uh, 50 years? Okay, 40 years. Here, here's sort of my, my, my theory. My theory is that the newer you are in your walk with the Lord, the more you understand how He took you from where you were and made you a child of God, and you understand your relationship to God as a, as a child of God, a, a son of God, a daughter of God. Conversely, I have found that the longer a person is a Christian, that relationship or that, that understanding of that relationship tends to kind of fade away. And we tend to see ourselves more as a servant of the Lord, to call to serve Him, to obey Him, to do all these other things that He wants us to do. So in my case, 70 years, 72 years since I've been born, but from the time I was born, I was brought to Assembly of God Church as my, by my parents. And I came to know the Lord when I was about seven or eight years old. But I don't ever remember not knowing about the Lord's love for me and Jesus dying for me. Because I was born, born and raised in a Christian family. The Don 
has the same experience. I won't tell you how many years that is, but she is younger than me. However, you notice she looks a lot younger than me, doesn't she? Uh, and there's a reason for that, that I look so much older than her. Uh, I'm easier to live with. And I don't know why I can't get people to, to believe that, that uh, but they always kind of give me that, you're joking, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Uh, no. Uh, so 70 years plus for me that I've known the Lord, known about him, gone to church. And I, have, I guess I have to say, in my case, that's sort of how I have come over a period of time. And that's how I came to see myself more as God's servant than God's son. And so that I put a question up in, on the PowerPoint here that said, you know, do you tend to see yourself uh, go back one? Do you tend to see yourself more as a child of God or as a servant of God? And again, my my theory is that the newer you are in Christ, the more your relationship as a child of God, a son of God, God's daughter, uh, tends to override the feeling of your being, first of all, a servant, and then later on you can you can be you know you can also uh, understand your relationship as a son. That's that's just a little a little bit of a theory that I that I operate under, and I guess as I said, I, I sort of come to that conclusion fr from my own experience. I, uh, as I already said. Good, good assemblies of God background taught first of all that to love the Lord, to work for the Lord, to please the Lord, to obey the Lord, and then maybe at a later time, or if we got a little time left over to think about your relationship him with Him, then to to see myself as 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 God being my heavenly Father and me as His Son. Uh, in other words, service seemed to always take priority in my life, at least over relationship servanthood, if you will, over sonship. And I, I, there, there was such an emphasis on this that when I went into ministry, uh, I, at times I was tempted to just almost work myself to death trying to do more for God, be more pleasing, be more, be more effective, uh, do more, do more, do more, and nearly working myself to death. Now, some might say that that's, that's a noble way to go, you know, rather burn out than rust out. Well, the only problem with that, that little statement is that either way you're out. Either way you're out, and when you're out, you can't do much for God if you're not here anymore. As David said, Lord, I can't, I can't praise you from the grave. And uh, so there's nothing really noble about burning out rather than, than rusting out. And, and I labored under that impression for, for a long time, in fact, it, it was about 10 years ago that I went through a, a very deep time of depression. And uh, I still remember the day. I went, I had a doctor appointment in the morning of that day. And I went and see my doctor. He's a Christian doctor in Racine. And next thing I know, I'm sitting in his office and I'm crying and I'm, and I'm exhibiting some definite signs of depression. And right there on the spot, Dr. Galberg took out his personal notepad and wrote a letter to my board saying, Pastor Held needs a break. Pastor Held needs some time away. And as it just so happened, I had a board meeting scheduled with my church board that night. And I, after conducting the business, I got out the letter, started to read it, started crying again, and, and finished the letter, gave it to the board, and they immediately said, Pastor, we, 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 we see something here, we, you need to be out of here. And uh, as I was talking with your pastor earlier this week, with Pastor Bob, and I started sharing some of this, he said, Ron, would you, would you mind just, do you mind sharing that with, with my congregation? I said, no, not at all. It's not something I go around talking about everywhere I am, but when I feel there's a need for people to understand what burnout, what depression can do to, to a person's outlook and perspective on life, I'm more than willing to share that because I, I don't know that's something that people always understand. And, and sometimes the impression is that, well, if we're, if we're really good Christians and really love God, and, uh, then that should never happen to us. Well. It happened to me, and I was really a good Christian, and I really loved the Lord, and I was working my, my, uh, 
backside off uh, for, for him the best I knew how, and still found myself going into, into depression. So the board sent me away. In fact, we went to a resident counseling center for a few days, and then we, have, we had a, a home on Spencer Lake that I had built as a place to retire someday, and so we went up there and took those months away, and uh, eventually got my feet back under me, got reestablished, and uh, stronger emotionally as well as I think spiritually and physically and, and came on back and, and had five or six more years of ministry at the church before I resigned to take on another ministry position. But uh, during that time that I was going through this depression is when God started to show me some things about how I saw him more as his servant than as his son. And so this message that I'm sharing with you this morning has its roots back there 10, I'm not even sure if it's 10 or 11 years ago, when God started to show me some things about how I saw myself, how I related to him. And so this, this idea of sonship versus servanthood sort of came out of, of that time. I just wanted you to have that little bit of a background today. And the message will not be as long as the, as the introduction, okay? Uh, but I wanted you to understand sort of where I'm, where I'm coming from on this today. So let's go to the next slide and let's read our, our scripture verse together. If you have your Bible, it comes out of 1 John chapter 3. However, the translation that I have on the screen here is out of the New Living Translation. And that's become one of my favorite Bible versions to read as a devotional and even as a study and uh, uh, preach out of it from it today. Let's, let's read together. Can we do that? Uh, I'll just read it off the screen. I was going to read it off my phone, but I didn't want you to think that I was checking my text messages, so I think I'll just, I'll just leave the phone in the, in the pouch here, and we'll, we'll, read, we'll read the verse off of the, off of the, power, off the screen here. Once you stand, let's read it out loud, shall we? Read it with me. We'll read it in unison. See how much our Father loves us. For he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him for we will see him as he really is, and all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. Father, I ask you to add your, your blessing, your anointing to the ministry of your word today. Let me help me to say the things that you've laid on my heart to say it with clarity and, and uh, with simplicity. Help it also to find eager listening ears and open and receptive hearts. And even more than that, to find a will that's ready to change and do things differently. So Lord, help us to be not only hearers of your word today, but to be doers of your word as well. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Now what, I, what I'd like to do to get started here this morning is to point out, help you understand the differences between sonship and servitude. Now, ladies, pardon me, I'm going to use the term sonship, not to the exclusion of daughtership, but somehow sonship and servantship just seem to go better than daughtership and servanthood. So, uh, so when I say sonship, I want to include you really in talking about our relationship as children, all of us as children of God. And I want you to understand this morning that there really is a wonderful difference between sonship and servanthood. And these are some things that I jotted down. You've got a copy of the notes there in front of you, and you can fill in a few of these blanks if you'd like. If you want to just listen, that's, that's your choice as well. But here are some ways that I see sons, a son of God, seeing themselves differently than a, than a servant of God, children of God versus a servants of God. Servants feel accepted because of what they do. A servant does a good job. A servant is fulfilling everything that's expected of him or her then they, they feel like they're accepted, they're okay the way they are. They depend on their workmanship 
and their performance to give them a sense of, of acceptance. Children, on the other hand, are accepted because of who they are. It's not based on what they do. They're, they're secure that they are accepted because of their relationship, their position. They're part of the family. They are, they are included there. And so the, the difference between sonship and, and servanthood, again, in this area of acceptance. Secondly, servants are motivated to serve because they receive wages. They're paid. They get their, their paycheck at the end of the, of the pay period, whatever that may be. Sons or, or children, on the other hand, serve because they are going to be included eventually in the inheritance. Servants serve because of wages. Children serve because they'll be included in the inheritance. Now, I don't know about you, but I would much rather, or may I ask you, put it this way, would you rather have the wages of a rich man, or would you rather have the inheritance that would come from a rich man? I don't know about you, but I'm gonna go for the inheritance over the wages, right? I think there's a good difference, big, big difference there. And so as children of the Lord, we're included in all of the inheritance, all the blessings that he promised us. The Apostle John in our text this morning said, See how much our Heavenly Father loves us, for he allows us to be called his children. And then the Apostle Paul comes right along on that in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, and he says, Now if we are children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. All of the blessings that come of being a part of God's family come to us because we're the children of God. We're not just his servants getting a, a wage, a living wage. We are, we are his children and he includes all the blessings he has for us in that. You see what I mean when I say it, it really is something special to, to live like, uh, like a kid's king today, a, kid, a king's kid today? Here's another way. Servants are, are anxious that their work will please the master. At the end of the day, the servant has, has, has peace of mind only if he or she has proven their worth by their work. They've done a good job for the day, they can go, kind of go home and feel, okay, that was a good day, everybody ought to be happy with me. The difference here again, a child rests secure in the love of his, of his family, of his father. And a child can be at peace at any time because they, of their status as a member of the family. It's not dependent on how much they do or how good they behave or how, how they act. It's dependent on who they are. And they, are, they can be at peace because of, of, of that relationship. And all in that same line, failure for a servant can be disastrous. His whole future, her whole future may be at stake. You could lose the, lose the job. On the other hand, a, a, when a child fails, when children fail, and they do, we do, they know that, that they may be corrected, they may be disciplined, but they're not going to be rejected. They're not going to be thrown out of the family. You see, failure, missing the mark occasionally, is not... It's not fatal if we understand our role as God's children rather than just as his servants. Here's one last thing. Servants know the will of the master, but children know the heart of the father. It's one thing to know what the boss wants you to do. It's another thing to know what's in the heart of the father and be included in that. Here's what Jesus said about that in John 15, 15. He said, a master doesn't confide in his servant. Now you are my friends, since I have told you everything the Father told me. You see, when we, when we fulfill our role as servants, at the end of the day, we, there's still a long, unending list of things to do tomorrow and the day after. Now with a child, the days are long too, and there's still things to be done. But here's the difference again. At the end of the day, the child goes home to father's house. And in father's house, he, he finds rest for his body and his soul and his mind. 
That's the difference. That's why I say there's a wonderful benefit, something special about learning how to live as one of the king's kids. Now, let's, let's think about the implications of this for a moment. If we are really absolutely convinced that we are one of the king's kids, then how would that truth, what are the implications of that? How would that truth affect our lives on a daily basis? If we think about it for a while, we might come up with some of these ideas. For example, if, if you knew you were absolutely positively convinced that you were one of the king's kids, would you ever again have reason to doubt whether he loves you and has accepted you and, and that he's pleased with you? I don't think so. You'd know that he's always looking out for you, that his, his love for you is, is continuous. It is based on whether you did good or not so good today. Like Paul, you would say, and this, this comes from the RH version, not, that's the Ron Held version. Uh, I am absolutely positively convinced that nothing can ever separate me from God's love. Are you, are you convinced of that? That would be one of the benefits, one of the results here of understanding our place as God's, God's kids. Secondly, you would be able to face anything that came your way because you would have this constant knowledge. You would know that God is always looking out for you, that he's always there for you, that he's on your side. He's not on your back. He's on, at your side. And again, with Paul, you could say, if God is for us, then who could ever be against us since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all? Won't he also give up everything else? You see, nothing is going to be withheld from us that we need if we're going to make it through. Thirdly, I think we would be more thankful to God every day because of all that he means to us. We would realize all the blessings that God comes to us and there wouldn't be a day goes by that we wouldn't send up some little second prayer to the Lord say, thank you God, thank you Jesus that I'm your, I'm your child. Thank you God that you've accepted me. Thank you God that you've forgiven me. Thank you God that you're looking out for me, that you're protecting me, that you're providing for me. Thanksgiving would be a way of life and not just something we'd stop to do once in a while in our prayer times. And then here's another thing I, I think would be a part of it. We would have another good reason to keep ourselves free from sin. Not because uh, we're afraid God will get, get angry with us and our sin does not please Him, of course. But we would do it. We would want to keep ourselves clean because we want to protect the reputation of the family. You see, one of the reasons we want to live for the Lord and live a life free from sin is that we don't bring disgrace to the name of Jesus or to the family of God. I heard about something that... Suppose a Christian did a couple of weeks ago, and as Ladon and I talked about it, we said, oh my goodness. What, what is the effect of that going to be on the reputation of that church? And even more importantly, how is the name of Jesus going to be discredited by what that person did? You see, it isn't just that our sins affect our relationship with the Lord. They affect how other people see God in the light of what we have said and done. So another good reason to keep ourselves pure, because we always want to do what would please our Heavenly Father. And then lastly, I, I think we would want to tell others about how special God is. We'd want to let people know why we love Him and serve Him like we do. We would want them to know why we want to spend time in His, in his presence and want to spend time in His house and be with God's people. Again, not because there's some kind of obligation to do this, not because someone's keeping attendance and, and marking off when we're not there. We want to do it now. We want to tell other people about the Lord because we want to, not because we have to. Not because it's some duty or obligation and, and boy, I've got to witness to those people whether I really want to or not, or whether they're going to hear. We, we do it now because it just flows out of, naturally flows out of the fact that we, we love Him and He's done so much for us and we're so thankful and we're so grateful and He's looking out for us and, and we're secure in His love. Those are all the reasons why we want to tell other people about how special God is. So there are some very, some very practical implications of living like a king's kid, aren't there? Now what about the application of this truth in our lives? If, wouldn't it be great if we could all live this way every day? What a practical difference we would make in our world every day 
if we were living like a king's kid on a special mission, a special assignment for him. If you pictured yourself walking out of the door of your house every morning wearing a t-shirt that in big bold letters on front and back said, I'm, a, I'm one of the king's kids, would that make any difference then as to how you might respond to someone in traffic who cut, cut you off on your lane? Would it, would it make a difference then how you responded to someone who didn't get your order right when you stopped by the fast food place on your way to work? Would it make a difference when you got to work if someone got upset and told you off in no uncertain terms? If you remember that you were one of the king's kids, your t-shirt said that. Would it make a difference in how you lived, how we lived our lives on a daily basis? Just a couple of areas in which that might affect us. What a difference I think that would make even in our own families. Let's start right at home. If we, if we were about to say something harsh or do something that would not be out of, out of kindness, uh, if we stop to remember that that other person is not just our spouse or not just our kid or not just our parent, but that other person is in fact one of the king's kids, as we are. Do you think that might make a difference? I mean, would you be a little less careful or how you responded to your spouse if you knew that you, if you responded in the wrong way, you could get in trouble with your father-in-law? The, 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 the big, the big father-in-law? <laughs> would it make a difference? If you were about to, to do something to one of your kids or got upset, lost your temper, would it make any difference if you realize that if I do that, I could be in trouble with my kid's real dad? I mean, the big dad. <laughs> See how practical this can be when we keep in mind what living as a king's kid, how it would affect our daily, our lives at home. How about, uh, how about our church? <laughs> what would our church be like if everyone in church treated everyone else like they too were one of the king's kids. Would it make a difference in how we got along with our brothers and sisters in the Lord? Or how we talked about them when they weren't there? If we remembered that they were one of the king's kids and he was looking out for them just as he is for us. See, I think it might have a very real effect and has some practical application Right here when we come to church. And then what about where we work? You say, well, there are none of, his, none of the king's kids there. You say, well, no, maybe not yet. But you know, he died for those people. And he loves those people just as much as he died for you and loves you. And you know, they just might, they just might want to become one of his kids if they saw someone else really living out their life as one of the king's kids. So how would it affect, how would the fact that, that you represent your heavenly family affect how you related to your coworkers tomorrow on the job? You know, you can be sure, I can tell you for a fact, and you know this, that they are watching you very carefully. And they're not terribly impressed by the fact that you don't do this or you don't do that or you go, you go to church a lot or uh, th th that doesn't really, what impresses them is how they see you acting on the job. And I can tell you this and you know this too, they have some very high expectations of what they think one of the king's kids, how they ought to act. And maybe that has something to do with whether they have or haven't yet opened their hearts to the love of Jesus. You see some very practical ways here, some life-changing ways, this, this idea of being a king's kid. You know, it could, be, it could be a real game changer in our lives on a daily basis if we kept that concept in mind all the time. So if... If you're not living like a king's kid, what, what could possibly keep you from doing that? I thought about that. I thought, well, maybe, 
Maybe someone feels guilty about something they did and, and can't accept the fact that, that God could love them enough to, to forgive them and receive them back into his family because of what they did. Well, I, have, I have good news for you this morning. God loves you that much and even more. And all he's waiting is for you to turn to him and seek his forgiveness. See, you know, here, here's what the Bible said God did with our sins. In, in Psalm chapter 103, it said he, he, he took our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. I'm totally turned around. Which way is east? Which way is east? That way? He took our sins as far as the east is from the west. You know, you could, you could start going east and you could pass out of Wisconsin and over into Michigan and across into New York and across the Atlantic Ocean and over the European continent and across the, the Russian uh, plain and, and keep on going till you got to the Pacific and keep going all the way across the Pacific till you got to the west coast of this country. Keep coming east all the way across. And any, as long as you keep going that direction, you're always going east. You never go west. East and west never meet as long as you keep traveling in that direction. Now, if you were to go north and south, you went up north from here and you went up across Canada and over the Arctic Ocean and over the North Pole. When you got to the North Pole and you kept going, you would now be going which way? You'd be going south, wouldn't you? And if you kept going south, you kept going over the top of the pole. Now you're going south. You keep going all the way down south till you get to those. So the South Pole, you keep on coming. At the South Pole, you kept on going. Which way are you going now? Now you're going north again. You see, north and south meet at the poles. East and west never meet. And that's why I think this, the Holy Spirit prompted the psalmist to say he took our sins from us as far as the east is from the west because those two never meet. The other thing it says in the book of Isaiah is that he, that he took our sins and put them behind him. He put our sins behind his back and then he promised never to look back there again. And I like the, the verse that says he took our sins and buried them in the depths of the sea. And then as someone else has said, and then he put up a sign saying, no fishing here. <laughs> He's not going to dredge them up again. They're buried. You drop something in the ocean, forget it. It's gone, right? That's what he's done with our sins. Separated them from the east and the west. Put them behind his back. Bury them in the depths of the sea. Don't worry about your past sin because there's nothing you've done that God can't forgive as long as you're willing to confess it to Him. So, whatever, if that's what's keeping you from coming to the Lord, then I, I encourage you to seek His face and seek His forgiveness. Maybe, maybe some are not on real good terms with others who are in God's family or claim to be. And maybe not any, even sure they want to be in his family if it means being there with him or her or them. You know, and they just soon stay away from that. Well, just think of what, what you're, all that you're missing out on. Is it really worth losing all of that just because of what someone may have said or done? I don't think so. I, I'd encourage you to let go of that old hurt and let God help you make things right again. Now maybe, maybe there's some who are thinking that they can do just as good a job of running the show as God can. And if that's you, then let me be Dr. Phil for a moment and say, so how is that working out for you? <laughs> really, how, how is it going if you're trying to make all those decisions and call all the shots and you're, you're standing out there alone? How is that really working out for you? Don't you get a little scared knowing it's all on your shoulders alone? Why not? Why not put things back in your father's hand? Is it a time you come back to father's house and turn things over to him? Now here, here's what I know about this. God, God never intended for us to make all our own choices and carry all our burdens alone. He, he wants to be our burden bearer. He said, cast your burdens, your cares, your concerns. Throw them, lay them, toss them on me, and I'll be your burden bearer. I love these verses in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. Jesus saying this, Come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle, and you will find rest for your soul. And I like it even better the way it's, 
translated in that version of the Bible called the message. Here's how it reads, it's on the screen. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me and get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to make a, to, how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch me do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. So again, if you're, you're feeling the weight and the pressures of life, take up, take up his invitation and come to him and find rest. And I, I love the fact that it says you'll find rest for your soul. You know, one thing to be rested in body, rested in mind, even rested in emotions, but soul rest goes to the very depth of your being. It touches the very core of who you are. And then let me come back to those of you again who may sometimes feel more like a servant of God, more like a gopher for God than a real, really one of God's forever kids. I want to encourage you and remind you, let God remind you again who you really are, that you are indeed one of his dearly loved children, his daughter, his son, in whom he is well pleased. Again, in sharing this message from somewhat of an autobiographical background, I, I don't want you to think that, that I've now got it all together in these areas. I, I haven't, I assure you. But I think over these last intervening years that God has helped me to get back on the right track and and after some time of wandering around in, in a state of disillusionment, I've, I've come to know how to apply God's grace to my own life, to my ministry. I, I think in recent years I've served him more from a position of sonship than just servanthood. I believe I'm learning to trust him more, and, and here's an area where there's still a, a lot of things that have to be worked out because at times my trust is based on more on what's going on outside and around me than what's going on inside of me. So there's some work to do here. But again, I want to share this message with you this morning in case some of you may, may be where I was or may be heading in that direction. If that's the case, let me encourage you to talk to someone, talk to a friend. You know, sometimes a listening ear can be such a great blessing and it can be an easy first step toward letting God reprogram some things in your heart and mind. Whatever you do, don't be so hard on yourself. Don't offer mercy and grace to everyone else and then give yourself only criticism and self-condemnation. God never intended for you to do that. Don't ex extend grace to everyone else and then use works performance to evaluate your own acceptance before God. Don't set unrealistic standards for yourself that not even God expects you to fulfill. And don't carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. Only Jesus can do that for you. Again, I, I don't know just where you identify with some of the stuff that I've been talking about today. But whatever it is, I I would more than welcome the opportunity to pray with you and before you leave today and, and ask God together to help to do a new work of grace in your life and bring you back to a place in his forever family as, as one of his very, very special kids. There's a little song that I've sung for a long time. Might be something you're familiar with, but maybe not. It just simply says, in my life, Lord, be glorified. It just repeats that phrase, be glorified. Be. And then another verse says, in, in our church, Lord, be glorified. Same melody, same lines. And then another verse that says, in our family, in my home, in our home, Lord, be glorified. It goes like this. If you can join with me, go ahead and join with me. In Thank you. 
today. I just ask you to do something for a moment. It's going to bow your heads. And then, here's what I want you to do. As you have your head bowed, if, if there's an area of your life in which you just need the fact that you're a child of God become more of a dominant factor in your home, and your family, and your job, and your own personal feelings toward God, if you'd like me to include you in a closing prayer here, as everyone else remains with their heads bowed, would you just look up at me and make eye contact? And I'm going to look over here to my left, to your right first. If this isn't a message that kind of strikes a response of no with you, would you just look up at me? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then let me go across over to this side. Yes, 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 yes. Father, you see the, the faces that are turned upward. They're not so much looking to me as they're looking to you and saying, God, I just need to re have you reestablish a strong sense of my relationship with you as a child of God, a son, a daughter in whom he is well pleased. I need you to let your sonship in my life affect how I relate to my family, to my colleagues, to our church. And Lord, you know what's behind the uplifted eye in each of these situations. And I would ask you, God, to be whatever that need might be. Lord, give assurance. Help them to know they can find forgiveness. Help them to know they can be restored to relationships with others. Help them to know how special they are to you today. And they'll come away from this service with a new appreciation for the fact that they truly are living like one of the king's kids. I pray this in Jesus' name. Again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to minister with you. Here's what I'm going to do in closing out. You're free to go. But if you'd like to just come back up here to the front as others are making their way out, and just let me pray with you about a specific situation that you may be facing, I'd be more than happy to stick around for a while. And we'll just come to the Lord together in prayer. And I'll lay this microphone down and we'll just talk. And just talk to the Lord. So if you'd like to come on up, as others are leaving, I'll just stay here for a few minutes. Everyone is gone, and we'll consider ourselves dismissed. Again, thank you for allowing us to be here. Would someone be sure the pastor gets a copy of this message today? Because I, I want him to hear this as well as his congregation.